All right, we are turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, and this this thought just come to me today, or, or not today, but this week sometime about Thursday or Friday, about the coming of the Lord. People tend to, well, there's a lot of talk about the second coming of Christ right now, a lot of discussion, a lot of preaching about the coming of the Lord in these days of the, uh, as it is called, the pandemic. Uh, and any time there is some kind of a nationwide or a worldwide catastrophic event it seems like people start preaching again about the coming of Christ that shouldn't be the Bible says he could come at any moment any time there's no sign that has to be fulfilled um, Paul included himself in the scriptures here matter of fact in verse Thessalonians chapter 4 and so during all these great events that we're talking about uh, you can go all the way back to the starting out in the New Testament, the persecution of the early church. Uh, and Second Peter and other these passages here deal with people who thought the Lord uh, had either come or was coming soon. And Paul had to uh, address that situation. Of course, it was something new to them. Uh, they knew the Messiah was coming, but they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And he died, resurrected, ascended back to heaven. And so when they start preaching about the second coming of Christ, um, that was sort of confusing to those Jews and uh, especially those who had been raised in the Old Testament scriptures. And so you had the persecution of the early church. They had the black plague and where uh, thousands died. The Irish potato famine had the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam War, the Iraqi War, now we have the coronavirus. And uh, any time there's such a situation like that, people say, oh, the Lord must be coming. But he could have come any time the last 2,000 years. He could come any time the next 2,000 years. I don't think it's going to be that long. Uh, but either way, if I am raptured to heaven or if I die and go to heaven either way is just fine with me amen I'm just glad I'm saved no I'm saved no I'm going to heaven and uh, looking forward to being there there's two passages I said we'll look at first Thessalonians chapter 4 and we're going to begin in verse number 13 first Thessalonians 4 verse 13 uh, and, and this is a familiar passage of scripture concerning the rapture of the saints of God in verse 13, it reads, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. So he's talking to save people. Concerning them which are asleep. That's a word that means they have died. Now, doesn't mean they're sleeping in church. It means they've died, all right? That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again... Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So you get this situation here. They're, they are, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. They are ignorant about some things. That means, doesn't mean stupid. Doesn't mean they're unable to learn. It just means there's new information that Paul has for them. And they are concerned about those who have died. Will they, will they be in heaven? Will they miss the rapture? If you miss the rapture, are you going to be uh, in heaven? And he said, I want you to sorrow not even as others which have no hope. We don't have any reason to sorrow. Whether you're asleep and you've died in Christ or you're still alive, you have reason to hope. You have reason, and the word hope means you have reason to be sure. You have reason to uh, be joyful about the coming of the Lord. In verse 14, he says the qualifications are you believe that Jesus died and rose again. And then even so them also which sleep those who are dead in Christ, their bodies in the grave, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The word prevent means we shall not precede them. We shall not go before them. That's an old English word, and it's our word today for the word proceed. 
So you've got, we're not going to go ahead of them. We're not going behind them. The Bible said the dead in Christ shall rise first, which means they're six feet below us, and they're going to come up. And then the Bible says, and uh, the, the rest of us are going to be caught up with the Lord. Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And look at verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So the second coming of Christ ought to comfort us. It ought to encourage God's people. Uh, if we're saved and know the Lord, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he has uh, taken away the fear of death. Death that man feared for so long now is no longer an enemy. You know the Bible calls death an enemy in 1 Corinthians 15. But now death is a friend that ushers me into the presence of Christ. So I have nothing to fear. Uh, one of the reasons I don't fear the coronavirus, I know it's real. I know people have died from it. I understand that. But I don't fear it. All it's going to do is most, you know, Really, only 1% of the people who get it die, actually die. 1%. You have, you have, driving the town, you have a bigger chance of that than getting killed on the highway going between here and town. But even if you get it, and even if you die, if you're saved, it doesn't matter how you go. You can go in a car wreck, you can go by a heart attack, you can go by the coronavirus. And so God has to overcome. The Bible says, well, not fear death. We uh, precious in the light of the Lord is the death of His saints. Now, to understand Second Thessalonians chapter two, I had to read First Thessalonians chapter four. So we're going to go to First or Second Thessalonians chapter two. And again, you're going to see right away and that he is talking about the coming of the Lord. He says in verse one, "Now we beseech you, brethren." by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be soon, or not soon, shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So he says we're talking about the coming of the Lord. We're talking about that time that we are going to be gathered unto him. Now he said, I don't, here, here's the same situation. Now listen, Paul's talking to the same people. First Thessalonians, the first letter, when they got that letter, it raised more questions, and now Paul's writing a second letter about the same subject. He says, uh, be not soon shaken in mind. He said, comfort one another with these words. They were trusted. I don't want you to be ignorant, because they were ignorant, they were upset, they are confused. But when he cleared up the matter, they can now be comforted by his words. He said, don't be troubled, either in spirit or by word. Don't worry about what other people are saying. Uh, don't worry about what some of the heretics are preaching. Uh, nor by letter as from us, nothing should shake you from this fact that the day of Christ is at hand. Now the day of Christ sometimes is speaking specifically about the day of the rapture of the saints of God. Uh, sometimes it is used to include the rapture all the way through the tribulation period. And sometimes that also is called the day of the Lord. And so he is talking about uh, the day of Christ is at hand. It, is, it could come at many moment, any moment. It doesn't mean it's going to happen right now. At hand means it can come at any time. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Now he's going to give us some uh, things that's going to happen before the Lord comes. And he says, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he's talking about the Antichrist. He's talking about this man, this, this son of perdition, the man of sin, he's going to come, exalt himself above God, set up himself as God, demand that people worship him, or uh, they will not be able to have to take the mark of the beast. 
and will not be able to buy or sell or trade or eat or anything unless they do that. Now, in verse number 5, Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So Paul says, if you remember back, not only did I tell you in the previous letter, but when I was there in person, Paul started the church at Thessalonica. And when he did so, he, he taught them some things about the coming of the Lord. He said, and now you know that, uh, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, that word means to hinder or restrain, will let. He who restrains will continue restraining until he be taken out of the way. And then that wicked, uh, the wicked shall be revealed, that wicked one, that man of sin, that son of perdition, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and thou destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that all that uh, they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now go back to verse 1 and the first thing we see is the coming of the Lord explained. And we, ha we have done this before but it's, it always is good to repeat things. Repetition is the mother of learning. But there are two phrases to Christ's coming. There is the rapture of the saints and then there is the return of Christ to the earth. Uh, he comes for the saints. He comes secretly. He comes quietly. In a moment, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, in the twinkling of an eye, that quickly we will be gone. In an unknown time, coming, uh, the Bible says, to the clouds, not coming to the earth. He comes to the clouds and he's going to receive the saints of God to heaven. That is the rapture of the saints of God. Number two, Jesus is going to come with the saints. And that's going to be very public. It's not going to be secret. The Bible said he is going to come in power and glory. And he's going to come to defeat the Antichrist. He's going to come to deliver his people Israel and take the remnant of Israelites into the, uh, uh, the millennial reign of Christ. So it's public. It's a known time. It is 1,290 days predicted by Daniel, three and a half years that this, this uh, time is going to take place to the earth and bring the saints to the earth. So it is, one is we're going to heaven, the second coming, we're coming to the earth. One first coming, we're coming to the clouds, second one, we're coming to the earth. First coming, we're actually going to heaven. The second coming, we're actually coming to the earth with the Lord to set up the kingdom. And so that is the two comings of, or two, we would say, the two phases of Christ's second coming. Now, there are two purposes for his coming. The first coming of Christ is to reward the saints of God. We've talked about the, the five judgments, the five crowns uh, that can we can receive as the Lord's people if we serve God. God said there's five crowns that are available to be won, uh, and we will be uh, rewarded for faithful service. The Bible also says that we'll take those crowns when it's all over with at the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll cast them at Jesus' feet. We're not going to wear them around heaven. We're not going to be bragging about how many crowns we have. We're really that everything we ever accomplished was by his grace and through his power and we're going to give glory to God and give him our crowns. The second coming of Christ when he comes to the earth he's coming not to reward he's coming to judge the world. Revelation 16 verse 1 listen carefully and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. We know there was the horseman judgment. There was the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, the vile judgments. 
And so we understand that he's coming back not to reward. He's not coming back at this time. He's going to judge the world. He's coming back to judge the world. And he's going to do that during that tribulation period. But even at the end of that period, all the enemies of God, all the enemies of Christ, the enemies of God's people, Israel, shall be destroyed. And only saved people will enter into the millennial reign of Christ. So we see the coming of the Lord explained. Secondly, verse 2, the comfort that he intended. He said that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. So he says there's comfort there. I don't want you to be troubled. I don't want you to be upset in your spirit. I don't want somebody to bring you word that's not true and you believe it. Uh, Not even if they say it's a letter from us, uh, if it's contrary to what I've taught. No, but they're going to say that that Christ is at hand. They're going to say that he's going to come right now and he may or he may not. In 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 18 that we read already, he said, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another. And I said, some had thought that the Lord had already come. Some thought that they had missed the rapture. That word shaken, he said, be not soon shaken in minds. It is a vivid word meaning to be uh, jolted into reality or shocked. Um, And he says, "Don't uh, don't be shaken. Don't be jolted. Don't be surprised. Don't be shockingly surprised about the Lord's coming. They had misunderstood Paul's first letter about the days of the Lord being at hand. That's not scary news. That's good news that Jesus is coming. I'm not, I I, listen, if you're saved and you're born again and you're serving God, uh, the Lord coming is a blessing. It's a comfort. We are in a sin-cursed world. We're living now, people living in fear. They're bound up in their homes Um, While this has all been going on, alcohol sales have gone up, suicide has gone up, domestic uh, violence has gone up, people are shut in together, now they're fighting one another, they're getting drunk, and pornography has gone up, they're getting bored watching all that kind of stuff. And so he said, don't be shaken, don't be jolted into reality. This is not sad news, it's good news that we can say, thank God Jesus is coming and he's coming for me and I'll be taken out of here. I'll be raptured out of this mess and I'm going to a place where there's no more disunity, no more disease, no more heartache, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more heart attacks, no more cancer. What man, why would you want to avoid dying? <laughs> I tell you, God said it's a comfort the Lord's going to come back. It's a comfort. Death can be a comfort. There's some things worse than dying. There's things worse than living. Now look at the third thing in verse number 3. The course of events. So we saw the coming of the Lord explained, the comfort that he intended, and the course of events that he lays out in verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, the day of Christ, the rapture and the following, shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. He mentions two things here. I want you to notice first of all, except there come a falling away first. That word falling away is our word for apostasy. It means falling away from the faith, falling away from the truth, falling away Uh, from what we know to be biblical and right. And so there are two different things that I look on the scene today. I see two different things that are coming of apostasy. Now apostasy has always been here, but it's going to be more spread. It's going to be more widespread. It's going to be more accepted than it has been in days past. And when he talks about that day shall not come, again, he's talking about the day of Christ, including the rapture and the tribulation period, that time period. But there's going to be religious apostasy. It's here already. It has manifested itself 
in people like Joel Osteen and Joyce Myers and uh, Benny Hinn and C. Flo Dollar and many, many others who just, they don't preach the Bible, they don't preach Christ, they don't preach, uh, they don't believe uh, heaven or hell's real, uh, they, they just deny everything, they don't, de they deny salvation, they deny the effort of the blood of Christ, uh, they don't believe in being born again, the Bible, the way the Bible teaches it, and so there are religious examples denying the existence of hell, the necessity of the new birth, the deity of Christ, the resurrection, it is found in every circle and almost every denomination is this religious apostasy that is worldwide today, it doesn't matter what nation you go to, you can go to the deepest, darkest part of Africa and there'll be somebody there preaching heresy and they are apostates. An apostate is not somebody who was saved and lost it. An apostate was somebody who professed to be saved and then their true colors come out and they deny Christ. They deny uh, the doctrines of Christ, not necessarily Christ himself. They'll preach Jesus, but as Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, they're preaching another Jesus and they preach about another spirit. Uh, they are not God's men. They're not God's preachers and many of them are women and God says women should not teach nor usurp authority over the man in the churches. And so there is a, a course of events that he laid out here and the first one is is this religious apostasy. But I see today especially there is a political apostasy. It's taking place right now before our eyes. Congress and the Senate, they have fallen away from the belief in the God of the Bible, uh, the God of their predecessors and their forefathers. I mean, you have to go very far back to uh, Ronald Reagan and some of those presidents who believed in God, testified about God, the need for God, keep trying to keep God in the schools and so forth. Uh, but they've fallen away from, they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. They're totally ignorant of the Bible. I remember just uh, probably it's been a couple of years ago when this uh, MS-13 thing was, was just sort of getting blowed out of position and um, and when Trump was trying to get this immigration laws passed so they send them back and Nancy Pelosi said you don't have any love because we're all the children of God no the Bible says they're children of the devil and the MS 13 she said should stay here because they're the children of God too ah, that's, that, is, that is beyond stupid that is willingly ignorant to make a statement like that when you get away from the Bible, when a person gets away from the Bible, you don't know what they're going to come up with. Because they're left to their own imagination, and the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And some of the things that we hear today come out of the mouth, not only of preachers, but out of the mouth of our politicians, is unbelievable. I would... I mean, I've been around long enough to say back, you know, years ago, you'd have never thought that, you'd have never heard that we need to become socialists, we need socialism in our country. You'd have never, nobody would have ever put up about that. Uh, you know, when they talked about communism coming, when Russia was trying to uh, come in, and the Bay of Pigs and Cuba and trying to get close... All that, I mean, they just, we, we rejected as a nation. We were willing to go to war to keep our liberty and to keep our democracy to really, it's a, it's a republic. We are a republic and uh, we have freedom, we have liberty. And yet they, they have politically fallen away from the true intent of this nation and the framers of the Constitution. They've fallen away from the belief of what those original those men wrote in the original constitution. They're falling away from what is a constitutional republic and now hold to socialism. And then you got some who are even Republicans who are just middle of the road, moderates, and uh, you never know which side of the fence they're going to vote on. It, and, and Paul said here, before the, man, before the rapture takes place, there's going to be an apostasy. The second thing he says is that the man of sin is going to be revealed. Notice verse 3. The last phrase of verse 3 says that the man of sin be revealed, 
the son of perdition. Perdition means judgment, speaks of hell. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ, the rapture, the tribulation period, shall not come except there come a falling away first, this apostasy, and then there's going to be a, re a revelation of the Antichrist. Did you ever stop to think that right now the Antichrist is probably alive? If he's going to come back in our lifetime, if he's going to come back in the next few years, he's alive somewhere on planet Earth. And he's going to rise to power here probably shortly. So the events, the order of events, is the apostasy. Secondly, the Antichrist revealed he's the man of sin. He's a man who is given to sin, given to sinful things. Sinful reign over the earth. He is called the son of perdition, the son of judgment, the son of hell. And then notice this order of events, the apostasy. Let me give you a verse out of 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. He said, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and need, even now already is it in the world. So Paul said in his day, John wrote 1 John, wrote the Gospel of John. And so he's writing, it's almost 100 AD now, it's almost 70 years after the death of Christ. And, and John says the spirit of Antichrist is already working. So it's been working for 2,000 years. And it's coming to a boil, it's coming to fruition it's coming to pass. It's, he said it's even now already in the world. So you got the apostasy, then you got the rapture, and you got the Antichrist revealed, that man of sin who's controlled and overcome by sin. He's the son of perdition, the son of ruin, the son of destruction. And he's going to destroy the world as we know it. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse four. Look at verse four. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. See, the saints in Thessalonica thought they were in the tribulation period. They're going through tribulation. Early church was persecuted. I mean, right off the bat, when Jesus died and disciples met in Jerusalem and they were in the upper room, the Holy Spirit came. They came out preaching the word of God. Peter and John in prison. James was beheaded. And the persecution of the early church started right there. And so now we find that they thought, well, this must be the tribulation period. No, it's not. Now, he talks about this, this time when... The Antichrist uh, will exalt himself above God. He'll declare that he is God. He will sit in the temple of God and claim that he is God. Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and 90 days. So he said from the time in the middle of the tribulation period when the Antichrist sets himself up as God, demands that everyone worship him, he said there's going to be another three and a half years. It's called the abomination of desolation. He makes it in Mark chapter 13 verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation, that is the abomination is going to be that he not only offers a sacrifice in the temple, but that he is going to declare himself as God. That is an abomination. And the Bible says when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Let them uh, be in Judea. Flee to the mountains. That's when that, that judgment comes. And he said if you're saved, you better flee to the mountains. Because that's when all this is going to take place. It's going to be uh, the mark of the beast. All these things are going to take place. Go back up to verse 4, uh, 2 Thessalonians verse 4. 
who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, or that he, as claiming to be God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself, declaring himself that he is God. Verse 7. Skip down to verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the, work, out of the way. That word letteth means to restrain, to hold back. So he says there's something that is restraining sin. There is something that is restraining the Antichrist from being revealed, from coming at this moment. But he said, when he that lets is taken out of the way. So the Holy Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. He is the one who restrains sin. He restrains sin in my life and in your life. When you do wrong, he comes and tries to help. He tries to restrain you. He gives you a way of escape. And now we find that he's going to, the Bible said, be taken out of the way. Not from the earth. He's not going to be taken from the earth because after this time, there's going to be multitudes of people saved and he's going to be the one working in their heart. He's going to honor the preaching of the Word of God of uh, those 144,000 Jews. He's going to honor the preaching of the Word of God of others. He's going to be with those two witnesses uh, uh, who, are, who are dead and then they rise from the grave. He's going to be with them. He is going to be here, but he's not going to restrain sin. And he's not going to restrain the Antichrist. Can you imagine? Think about this. You know what the world is today. Think about it, what the world will be like when the Holy Spirit says, I'm taking my hands off. Off of sin. And we read about sin and horrible, horrible just awful things that we would never have imagined. And then the Antichrist, he's not going to be anything holding him back. Not going to be any restraints on him. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. And he's filled with the devil. He is demon oppressed, demon obsessed, demon possessed. Satan himself. Look at verse 8. He goes on, and then shall that wicked... We would say, then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's not going to take place till after the tribulation period or the end of it. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Do you remember when the four horsemen came? The first one rode on a white horse, and people like, well, that was Christ, it's white. But no, he's an imitator. Whatever, whatever the Lord does, the devil will imitate it. Whatever the Lord does, the Antichrist is going to imitate that. For example, both Jesus and the man of sin have a coming. We're talking about the coming of the Lord. And there's a coming of the Antichrist. Jesus and the land of sin have a revealing. There is a day when Jesus was revealed. There's going to be a day when Jesus does come back on that white horse. It's not the same white horse in Revelation chapter 6. It is that white horse that comes to the Mount of Olives. The Bible says that when he touches the Mount of Olives, it's going to split in half. You have the Valley of Megiddo, and then you have all the armies who are all together there against Israel. And the Bible says God's going to destroy by Antichrist and all of his armies and cast them into hell where the beast and the false prophet are. Both Jesus and the man of sin have a gospel. All of, they, they all have a gospel. Jesus and the man of sin, the Antichrist, they alone claim to be worshipped. Jesus said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. And the Antichrist is going to say the same thing. I am God. And both of them have support their, I mean, they support their claims with miraculous works. You see that in the verses that we just read. He said um, that, uh, what, anybody see what I'm talking about? I'm falling away first. Um, 
Verse number 3. Yes. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a calling away, falling away. First man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now I'm looking for, it says, um, with all signs and lying wonders. That's got to be probably in the first two verses. Um, hang on, because I want to read this. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So just as Jesus performed all those signs, miracles, caused the lame to walk, he caused the sick to be made whole, he caused the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, the blind to see, just like Jesus did all that, this Antichrist is going to perform miracles but it's going to be in the power of Satan. He comes after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. You say, but can the devil do stuff like that? Go back to Moses. Go back to Moses' day when those false prophets around Pharaoh cast their rod down and it became a snake. They have power. The devil has power. And think about that power. It's not going to be restrained anymore. The Spirit of God is going to not restrain sin or Satan or the Antichrist. I mean, this world is going to run wild with no restraints whatsoever. And then notice in verse 10, the curse of unbelief. Look in verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Here's people who heard the gospel. You say, is the gospel going to be preached in the tribulation period? Yes. The Bible says the angels even came and, and uh, preached an everlasting gospel. The 144,000 preached and they preached the gospel. Uh, the Bible says there's going to be a multitude saved out of, of uh, uh, the tribulation period. He said of every nation and tribe and kindred all those people, multitudes be saved in that. But here's some people who heard the truth and they rejected the truth. They love not, they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now look at verse 11. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. There's a lie. The lie is, is that the Antichrist is the Christ. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You can boil this down to, first, to, to four statements. Number one, they heard, but rejected the truth. They are without excuse. They heard the gospel. I mean, you take, listen, when the rapture takes place and every single Christian, born again Christian on earth, is raptured out of here, and they see that, and then all of a sudden people start preaching the gospel. People are going to get saved, They're going to, and God's going to call them. And there's going to be 144,000 Jewish evangelists, we know, and others preaching the word of God. So they heard, some of them heard, before the tribulation started in this life right now. If Jesus were coming right now, how many people on earth have heard the gospel? but rejected it. They rejected the truth. Number two, because of that, they will be cursed with strong delusion. He said they're going to believe the lie. The lie is the Antichrist is the Christ. The Antichrist is the Messiah. That's what he's going to claim to be. I am God. I am God. I am the Messiah. I am the Savior of the world. If you'll come and worship me, I can fix it all. They'll be cursed with strong delusion. They will be damned, the Bible says. Mark 16, 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. They're talking about dying, going to hell, and burning forever in a Christless eternity. They're going, they heard, but rejected. They're going to be cursed with strong delusion. You know, you, sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, I, I'll just get saved after Jesus comes. Not if you've heard the gospel. If you've heard the gospel, you're going to believe that Antichrist is the Christ. 
And it's, uh, that delusion is going to come from God. That's the curse of unbelief. That you would not be saved while you could have been saved. And it tells us here why they didn't get saved. It says they loved pleasure of unrighteousness. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. The last phrase of verse 12, they had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know why people don't get saved? They don't want to give up their sin. They don't want to repent. They love their sin. They refuse to repent. They refuse to turn from their sin. They love their pleasure and therefore they say, I, I, I don't want to get saved yet. You hear people all the time, preacher, not yet, not yet. What are they saying? They're saying, I still love my sin. And I'm not willing to repent of my sin. Second Thessalonians 1 and verse 8 says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. This is what God's going to do with those who reject and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is not just something you believe. He said the gospel is something you obey. What is the commandment? What is the commandment of the gospel? Repent and believe the gospel. That's not a suggestion. It's not something you just believe. It's a commandment you obey. Today God says repent and believe the gospel. And people say, oh, not today. You just rejected the gospel. And you disobeyed God. He's not giving you an option. He's giving you a command. Repent today and believe the God. The day is a day of salvation. 